Now, them talking about that uh, mud and dirt and water reminded me that uh, I ha- if you guys haven't uh, picked up a souvenir from Israel yet, uh, I-, I went to Israel last month, if you don't know, uh, the seminary, uh, and uh, anyway, I brought back these little vials of dirt from a shepherd's field in Bethlehem and Jordan River water. So there's a few left. I, I it's like at least one per family, you know. So if you haven't got one yet, uh, see me after the service and take a souvenir. It's my token of appreciation for you providing for me uh, to do so. Well, I often marvel at the providence of God. You know, this passage that we're going <clears> to <throat> preach about this morning was chosen for me, telegraphed by the Holy Spirit as I sat on the steps of the Siloam Pool in Jerusalem, in today's lesson. What's remarkable is the perfect timing, I pray, that these comforting words will bring some dear friends of mine during their current suffering, because, as Pastor C.K. Barrett says, this short chapter expresses perhaps more vividly and completely than any other John's conception of the work of Christ. You see, we collectively as a society have this misconception that the world works by karma, or what goes around comes around. Religion works on the concept of quid pro quo, or this for that. But this story proves otherwise to us. Last night, as a bachelor, because Rebecca and the girls are in Pittsburgh, as I sat dining on God's chicken at Chick-fil-A, I saw this woman next to me with a shirt that read, It's not religion. I'm forgiven. Exactly, I thought. But our society believes the opposite. They think that if bad stuff happens to you, you must have sinned and deserve it. And conversely, if you're doing well, you must be living right with God. This couldn't be further from the truth. And today, in today's lesson, we'll find out why. There basically are three parts to this text that we are going to unpack in detail. The first is the initial question in the miracle itself. The next is the Pharisees' response to it. And lastly, this is a call to faith. So miracle, response, and call. So let me set the scene. Jesus is in Jerusalem, in the city of David, This is by the southern steps of the Temple Mount. Last month, I had the opportunity with the seminary to retrace the steps of this miracle on Pentecost. We walked the 500 yards traversing chilly, ankle-deep water in Hezekiah's Tunnel, which terminates in the Siloam Pool, the site of today's miracle. It is profound to spend a half an hour walking in darkness through a shoulder-wide tunnel, and emerge into the light in this pool. The the same site where later on in Acts, the disciples baptized thousands of people on the church's birthday. So Jesus is in the heart of his ministry. The Pharisees are constantly trying to trip him up and watching his every move. He is making remarkable claims that he is both the Christ, the Son of God, And the great I am. It is here where we find this morning's gospel lesson. Turn with me now to the short chapter of John 9. We're going to read almost all of it. Listen now to the word of the Lord. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Jesus answered, Neither this man or his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay from the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. He said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, the word meaning scent. 
So he went and washed and came back seeing. Therefore the neighbors of those who had previously had seen that he was blind said, Is this not he who sat and begged? Some said, It is he. Others said, Oh, he isn't merely like him. He said, No, I am he. Therefore they said to him, How were your eyes opened? He answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go wash in the pool. So I went and washed, and I received sight. They said to him, Who is he? He said, I did not know. They brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Now it was the Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees who had asked him again how he had received his sight, and he said to them, He put clay on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Skipping ahead a bit to verse 25. The Pharisees were calling the man back in the same questions. Who healed you? He must be a sinner because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. He answered them and said, Whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I do know. Though that I was blind, now I see. And they said to him again, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them again, I already told you, and you do not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become one of his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, You are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. We know that God spoke to Moses, and for this fellow, we do not know where he is from. The man answered and said to them, Why, this is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from, and yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone who is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears them. Since the word began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him and said, You were completely born in sins, and now you are teaching us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they cast him out. And we had found him. He said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking to you. Then he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, We see. Therefore, your sin remains. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Would you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And if I should say anything that is not of your will, may it fall to the ground and be quickly forgotten. But Lord, when you speak your truth to your people, may you write it on our hearts and change our lives forever. Amen. Karma. <coughs> In a way, it's what the disciples were asking Jesus about. Is this man being born blind because of karma? Or maybe quid pro quo? That's what the Pharisees were arguing after all, as they leveled their charge of blasphemy against this man and Jesus. And then there's us, trying to make sense of it all. Again, there are three parts we're going to look at. The miracle, the response, and our calling. First, the miracle. 
Notice that the passage starts off by saying, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. The disciples didn't see or notice this man. Jesus did. It was the disciples seeing Jesus see the man that caused them to ask the question, who sinned, this man or his parents, for him to be born blind? Now Jesus categorically and immediately throws out their argument, neither, he says. Now you have to understand what is happening for them to ask this question. In first century Palestine, the culture was extremely superstitious. They correlated things that didn't need to be correlated. They had no understanding of germs, disease, or modern medicine. So if you had an unexplainable ailment, it must have been divine judgment or karma come to get you and punish you for your sins or your children. We know better today, right? (laughs) Wrong. How do you explain this widely held belief of karma in our society today? Now, to me, it's very simple. It's a lack of faith in God. Well, like every other religion in the world, karma or quid pro quo operates on a basis that you, the individual, are the master of your universe, the captain of your soul. However, the gospel says, no, it's all grace. I don't merit my next breath, my next heartbeat. Therefore, I owe it to the true master of the universe, my life, my obedience, and my all. Even if you've been a Christian for 40 years, or if you're one of Jesus' apostles in this lesson, this passage shows us that we are always going to struggle with understanding the nature of sin. It's hard for us to imagine why a loving God would allow suffering in this world. Well, let me answer that by first reminding us that suffering is not his design. He created us to live in the garden. But it was us that chose sin, corrupting the earth. God is not the author of our suffering. We are And if you agree with that logic, then you must follow it to its end. The man in this story was once a baby. As it mentioned specifically, he was born blind. If you read down in the passage, we read about his parents. How tragic it must have been for them. You know, that society believed that they were cursed or were getting their comeuppance for sin. No doubt they were shunned. In the text, they specifically distanced themselves from their own son. He is left to a life of begging and suffering. It was just about impossible for that blind beggar to see the purpose of his suffering. But it wasn't for God. You see, that baby was perfectly and wonderfully made. Where man sees a defect, God sees a flawless child of the covenant. Before the foundation of the world was set, God Almighty, the great I Am, ordained this man's life to be as it was. Just as he has done for me and for you, for his glory. It's hard for us to see the purpose of his glory in our suffering we might never know the reason for it in this life anyway. But trust me, if this lesson is any evidence, it's that he has a plan for it. He's going to use it for his good. So imagine being that man, born blind your whole life, feeling the warmth of the sun, the light, but never seeing it sitting there in the pool, begging. And before a fuss, before you know it, a fuss is being made over you. You may have heard the religious people talking about this new rabbi, but you don't know who he is. 
Then you were reminded of your shame as they're talking about you. Your sin or your parents' sin that you believe caused you to be this way. And then suddenly, the rabbi defies everything that you've ever been taught and tells you. You did nothing wrong to cause this. You're confounded. Even more so when you hear him spit. You probably get spit on a lot as a beggar. Nothing new, but then the stranger makes a little clay with the mud and wipes it on your eyes and tells you to go wash. Now, one small detail that we cannot leave out is that it says this day was the Sabbath. Washing, other than ceremonially cleansing the hands, is forbidden on the Shabbat. This blind man with mud smeared on his face walks down to the Siloam pool and bathes. Can you imagine it? Only ever seeing nothing but darkness, not able to reconnoiter the world at all, and in an instant, healed. John Calvin said, For nothing is more magnificent than when an unwanted power of God corrects and restores the defects of nature. And nothing is more beautiful or more delightful than when, through his boundless goodness, he relieves the distresses of men. An unwanted power of God. It must have dawned on this man I didn't even ask to be healed. What a miracle! In lots of other examples, a person petitions Jesus for healing, demonstrates faith, and then they are healed. But in this case, Jesus is compassionate, seemingly without cause or merit. It was, however, on the Sabbath. If this story occurred any other day of the week, chances are... We may have never heard about it, but specifically, Jesus did this to teach, instruct, and correct. I want to be really clear on this point so it is not lost on us. It is hard for people to accept that God would ordain this innocent baby to be born blind and suffer for a lifetime just to teach the disciples, the Pharisees, and us a lesson today. But the Bible is full of stories like this. So why is it so hard for us to accept? It's because it takes the sovereignty away from us and puts it squarely and only upon God's shoulders where it belongs. Realize that if God really did weigh our merits and our demerits on a sliding scale of goodness versus our sin, there would be none of us left. Folks, if my goodness was weighed against my sin and a balance was needed to stay positive to draw my next breath, I wouldn't make it to the parking lot before I dropped dead. Jesus tells us that the most righteous man that ever lived John the Baptist, who possessed more righteousness than all of the Pharisees combined, couldn't enter the kingdom by himself and was counted as the least. To put it simply, God does not work this way. When we suffer, we either feel anger or guilt, and Jesus is saying, no, feel neither. It doesn't work that way. You don't have to pay for sin twice. Jesus Christ went to the cross and paid for it in full. He was the only person in the history of the world to know no sin. The only person not under its curse. The only blameless person that ever lived, and he took the punishment for all of us. You might say, okay, Patrick, I I get your point. But if the cross was enough, why does God allow suffering today? Why are there hurricanes and cancers and murders and birth defects? All I can say is, it's his will. And that may be a hard pill for us to swallow, but hear me out. Tim Keller says, 
The band was born blind so that. There's two little words. So that. You see, there is always a reason for it. Suffering is not for nothing. Never. Now, you have to be careful here. Very importantly, you have verses like Lamentations 3, where it says, God hates our affliction. He is sad with us in our affliction. He didn't design the world to be full of pain. On the other hand, you have verses like Romans 8.28 that says, All things work together for the good of those that love God. You have Ephesians 1 verse 10 that says, Everything happens according to the counsel of his will. Pain was not God's design, and yet all pain and suffering in your life is governed by God's will. That means he controls what's there. That means he monitors it. It means he channels it. It means as a Christian, we can sit down and say, I'm suffering today, and God is mad about that. And he has done something in history to deal with suffering and eradicate it forever. And yet I know that his will governs the pain in my life today. I know that it's not for nothing. It's so that. There's a purpose for it. There is an appointment. There is an agenda. And it's a loving agenda. What if the purpose of your suffering was to get you to remove the scale of mud from your eyes so that you could no longer be blind? Ask yourself, what wouldn't I be willing to endure? What wouldn't I be willing to sacrifice to see the glory of God? After learning about all of this in an instant, The blind man is accosted by the Pharisees. There's an incredible interaction between them. They can't see, rather they choose not to see, the miracle for what it is. They even interrogate his parents, at first thinking that they are simply fooled that this was just a prank or a trick. But the parents don't want anything to do with him. They know that their livelihood and social status would be ruined if they became believers in Christ. So they kept silent, even after seeing their son healed. I believe that is a powerful indictment against us today. When confronted with overwhelming evidence for the gospel, what do we do? We sit on our hands. Now, we don't want to rock the boat. But this blind man doesn't care about the consequences. He boldly speaks the truth and defends the good news in his life without even knowing its source. And he is kicked out of his lifelong congregation for doing so. Friends, when the light of Jesus truly takes root in your heart, you will never be the same. Never was proclaiming the good news a calling to the mundane or the ordinary. This was a calling to be a bold and passionate believer. And it is often the case in the presence of suffering goes hand in hand with the presence of God. Therefore, joy isn't, therefore joy, it seems, isn't necessarily the absence of suffering but the presence of God. What wouldn't you do to have him draw near to you? In today's lesson, after this poor man was cast out by the very people that should have been ministering to him his whole life instead of silently judging him and his parents and keeping him at a distance, the scripture says that Jesus sought him out. Jesus sought him out. The blind man barely even knew his name. Our Lord said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? He answered him and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? 
And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he that is talking to you. How magnificent that Jesus would have opened the eyes of his heart before the truth opened his eyes. He didn't know what Jesus looked like because he was still blind when the mud was wiped from his face. Even though we see, we're blind. Therefore, we must ask ourselves, would I be willing to endure suffering to see? Well, Jesus thought that suffering was worth it. He left infinite light and peace and joy and happiness in heaven to come down and dwell in our dark world to light a path for us to follow him home. Jesus continued, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those that see may be made blind. This is an echo of the statement he said in verse 4. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. The Pharisees heard this and reacted to it, asking him, Are we blind also? Earlier, when speaking to the blind man, trying to justify themselves, they said to him, We know that God spoke to Moses. They were referring to Exodus 4, verse 11, which reads, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seen, or the blind? Have not I, the Lord? The logic in this line of arguing was to ascertain who Jesus was. Before the miracle occurred, Jesus claimed to be the great I am. That spoke to Moses. It is no coincidence that they would snarkily ask him, Are we blind also? They were referring to the fact that they could indeed see. And Jesus' reply is legendary. If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, we see. Therefore, your sin remains. Jesus is the creator. He is God incarnate. He was there with God in perfect unity with the Holy Spirit before the foundation of the world was set. He is the great I am. He alone gives man the ability to see. He is the only path to salvation. Without him, we would be blind and stumble in the darkness, just as they did. This is such a powerful testimony for the fact that regeneration precedes faith. Jesus must first open the eyes of your heart, and it matters not if you can see with your eyes. Therefore, whatever ailment that you have, whatever suffering that you are going through, he wants you to lay it down at his feet. It's for a purpose. He is crying out to you, saying that you don't have to go through this alone. I am with you, and I will never leave you. I will hold you when you stumble, like a father and a friend, and I will carry you through darkness until we see the sun again. So rest your head and cry your tears. Know that I am with you even here. Because when you can't lift that weight, believe me when I say, I will. So how do we respond? First, karma is a myth. So rather than believing in it, we should keep out an eye for the blind, the deaf, the mute, and the lame. Remember, it wasn't the disciples that attended to the blind man. It was Jesus. But he is calling us to be his hands and feet. We shouldn't do good because we think it's going to come back around to us like karma. We should do good just to get God, not his things. 
What if you are the answer to the prayer that someone is asking the Lord for? You can be the miracle that they desperately need. Secondly, we need to take careful stock of the scales that may be over the eyes of our hearts. Are you really just bumping around through life, walking aimlessly in the darkness, but telling yourself that everything is all right and that you can see just fine? This is a dangerous place to be in because outwardly everything appears to be going well, but the moment trouble comes, beware. Suffering will make you angry and bitter and harden your heart. And lastly, if you are suffering today, know that God Almighty has been there too. He suffered immeasurably more than we can ever imagine on the cross. The only one of us who didn't deserve to be crucified. There were two things that held him there. His unending love for us and his divine wrath to end sin and suffering forever. So the question today is simply this. Are you walking in darkness or light? Even in suffering, can you hear the still small whisper of the Holy Spirit asking, do you believe in the Son of God? If you answered yes confidently, rejoice, for you know that joy comes in the morning. And if not, I pray that you would be like the blind man who asked, who is he? For this morning, you have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Amen. Would you pray with me? Oh Lord, how we love to walk in the darkness. We revel in it because we think we know better than you. The evidence is all around us. We are terrified of the light. We are afraid of letting our guard down and being vulnerable because we fear being known. We all have skeletons in our closet. We hide them out of a sense of guilt, shame, and anger. We think the world owes us better than we have. We, do, we try to cram religion into your gospel, but you will have none of it. You tell us that that's not how it works. We so badly want to earn our way into your presence, but time and time again you assure us that your cross is enough. Help us believe it today. Let us relinquish the control we have over our lives and submit ourselves to your plan. Melt our hearts for the extraordinarily awesome plans that you have for us, even if it involves suffering. We think that these plans must be safe and void of risk, but you show us that becoming your disciple never ends in luxury and comfort. It almost always is a road marked with suffering. You've shown us today that there is a purpose for your plan, that our suffering is meaningful, just as yours was on the cross. It was the loudest expression of love the world has ever known, and by comparison, what's the little bit of rain in our lives? You hung there on the cross, letting the world know for all eternity that I love my glory. What if our suffering was for your glory? What wouldn't we be willing to go through or sacrifice? Rejoice as we counted ourselves worthy to suffer dishonor for your name. Lord, this is a hard pill to swallow. So that you, we pray that you would open our eyes to it that you would remove the blindness from our hearts. Jesus, we want to follow you. We no longer want to walk in darkness. But give us resolve to be your hands and feet, to serve the ones that do, that you need to redeem. Let us be the mirror that shines the light of truth onto their path. We pray for the hurting here in Huntington. We pray for the outcast, the addict, and the abused. We pray for the unborn life in our congregation and around the world today. We pray for all those who have recently lost a loved one. We pray for our pastor and his family. 
We pray for all those who suffer here today. Lord, let them feel your presence near them in this moment. We pray for our city, our first responders, our government, on every level, Lord. Let thy will be done. We pray for our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines. Lord, keep them safe. We ask all of these things in the name of our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.